do Departamento de História e do Programa de Pós-Graduação em História Econômica. Eu queria agradecer a, a professora Makloski por ter aceitado o nosso convite para vir é, falar aqui. Uh, eu vou fazer uma apresentação muito rápida dela. Uh, eu imagino que a maior parte de vocês é, já conheçam o trabalho. Ela fez a graduação, pós-graduação em Economia na Universidade de Harvard. É, seu trabalho em Chicago foi marcado por sua contribuição à revolução da cleometria na história. Aqui eu vou falar principalmente sobre a contribuição para a história. Uh, mas também ensinou gerações de economistas com destaque às teorias do valor em Chicago. A sua principal contribuição foi sobre a história econômica britânica, a quantificação na pesquisa histórica, a retórica na economia, metodologia econômica, ética das virtudes, economia feminista e economia heterodoxa. Uh, eu acho que o resto a gente vai poder falar melhor depois, eu não quero que a gente se estenda muito nisso, e a ideia é que a gente tenha mais tempo para o debate, para a discussão uh, sobre o, o trabalho dela, e, e menos uh, ser, sermos menos passivos, tá bom? Obrigado. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, was, as he explained, an, an economist. I didn't say communist by uh, origin. I was, and, but I've, I've been a member of three history departments, a voting member. My last year at, as a professor at the University of Chicago, I was in the hi large history department there, and then for 19 years in history, as well as economics at the University of Iowa, and then for uh, 15 years, until I retired a couple of years ago at my, my beloved history department at, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And it's in those memberships of history departments that I got socialized, finally, in the intellectual values of historians. Now, you know, even as an economist, I was slightly less barbarous than my colleagues in economics at the University of Chicago, or for that matter, Harvard. But um, I've gotten more and more um, concerned that economics should not be just materialism. It should be about ideas and ideologies, too. And the evidence for how an economy works or how history has gone so far as the economy is concerned, should be all human evidence, the humanities in particular. And in these three, and look, I'm a quantitative economic historian. For a person of my PhD generation, I'm unusually well trained in econometrics. I didn't ever use it for anything, but I was well trained in it. Um, and I'm always quantitative in, in these books, this trilogy that I completed last year, praise the Lord. Um, it, uh, it, I've, I'm, I'm continuing to ask quantitative um, questions. There aren't very many tables of statistics in these books, but there, I'm always asking how big, how big, how big. But on the other hand, I'm also asking, which I think is necessary for any scientific enterprise, what is it? The first stage in any piece of science, historical or otherwise, is categorization. What's a Brazilian and what's a non-Brazilian? Are the first nations of Brazil, do they include, do they, are they included as, as, as Brazilians? or are they something else? Those qualitative questions, what's good, what's bad, what category this is in, comes before counting, comes before the numbers. Now, I think to do a full scientific study of many subjects, you need both. But in any case, you need this humanistic stage of qualitative thinking. It's philosophical, historical, um, ideological. You have to, have to think through these things. So I've, I've finally come to that. And, and so now I'm a, 
I call my, what I do, humanomics. <laughs> Economics with the humans left in. And I think that's a sensible scientific um, uh, program. And it's certainly shown in these books where I use, for example, Shakespeare's evident ideologies against the bourgeoisie and in favor of hierarchy and the aristocracy and contrast them with the more subtle ideology of Jane Austen, the great English novelist, the first really significant female voice in English literature. So it's sort of 1610 versus 1810. And there's a change there. There's a very significant change in the attitude towards the economy, towards the actors in the economy, towards what's good and bad, to get in these categories, what counts as desirable behavior. In Shakespeare's world, the only road to honor is the queen or the king, is the court. Whereas in Jane Austen's time, banking, farming, um, is an honorable occupation. All right, so these three books, I can, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to speak for about 20 minutes, say. So start thinking of questions now. I, I used to do this. I used to listen to lectures and just kind of passively listen. And then at the end, the lecturer would say, well, have you any questions? I said, question, questions? What, my, my word. Yeah, I, should, I, I, should, I, sh I should have been thinking while she was talking. So please, start thinking right now and formulate things we can, we can talk about afterwards. But the, 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 these volumes are called the bourgeois era. First one on, on, on the left there is um, the, the bourgeois virtues. I use bourgeois in the title of all three in order to lean against the presumption, which is a problem in Brazil, of sneering at the, at the middle class, at the bourgeoisie. But all I mean by it is the middle class. And, and as in the French and American revolutions, the middle class, the bourgeoisie, bleeds over, so to speak, or is a representative of, of the common people, of the third estate. The, 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 the aristocracy, the clergy, and the people. So in that first volume, which I started thinking about in the early 90s, so I've been thinking about this for a long time, I asked myself, is capitalism corrupting? Is it necessarily corrupting? I think it can be corrupting, but so can any society. Socialism in the USSR, in that long experiment, was, I think, quite corrupting of the character uh, of, uh, of the Russian people. They became greedy and envious. And uh, yeah, it, it had a bad effect on them. Well, the same thing can happen in capitalism. But I argue there that it's greatly exaggerated, that it's quite possible for a life in commerce or invention to be a virtuous life, to, to show the standard virtues of prudence, of course, but also of temperance and courage, um, justice, faith, hope, and love given secular definitions. And, um, but then it occurred to me, and I, and I kind of remember the day when it occurred to me. It was very exciting. When I realized that I, had, I might have hold of, I wasn't sure of it, but I might have hold of an explanation of the modern world. An explanation of why we change so much. 
we Europeans, and now we Chinese and Sub-Saharan Africans and South Asians, why we changed so much from what we were in, say, 1600 or 1700, and, and how that affected our amazing wealth. I, I came to see that a sociological change, not a psychological one such as Max Weber articulated in the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism in 1905, which everyone here should read. It's one of the hundred great nonfiction books of the 20th century. But, you know, in science, it happens that it's wrong. It's wrong theologically. It's wrong sociologically. Quite surprising, this founder of sociology got the sociology wrong. It's certainly wrong as economics, as history. Wrong, 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 wrong. The correct story, as I tell most explicitly in the third volume, Bourgeois Equality, how ideas, not capital or institutions, enrich the world, is that there was a change, an alteration. I call it the bourgeois revaluation, but you can call it anything you want. In attitudes, in sociological attitudes towards the, the bourgeoisie, towards workers, towards work itself. I'm just reading Alan Taylor's History of the Period of the American Re Revolution, which is a good book. Not as good as people say, but it's good. Um, and, he, and he points out that in, early in the 18th century in, in the colonies, the, 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 the mainland colonies of England in North America, the, the, the old hierarchies were in place. Men over women, masters over servants and slaves, gentlemen over commoners, and so forth. And my claim is that ideologically those started to break down, especially in the 18th century. The idea that all humans are created equal is an extremely radical idea. One sees it articulated in the English Revolution of the 1640s by, by, by the levelers, who, by the way, were very much in favor of commerce and property. But they, when Charles I went to be executed, he was allowed to speak from the scaffold, as people are in England. And he said, don't you see, he, was, he had been convicted by a court, don't you see a subject and a sovereign are clean, different things? That's that humanistic categorization from which all thought has to start. So there was a change, an alteration. Among the advanced intellectuals like Voltaire, um, Adam Smith, um, Hume, uh, Tom Paine, Mary Wollstonecraft, in the long 18th century, the, they believed in equality in a very deep sense. Matt, Adam Smith. If you haven't read an read Adam Smith, you don't know this, but if you will read him, you will see that he's an egalitarian. He's not in favor of the old hierarchies. So it broke down for 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 reasons that I explain in in the third volume are matters of um, are accident. <laughs> something we should never underestimate in history. Sheer accident. Stupid, happy mistakes or bad mistakes, anyway mistakes, um, that had n have nothing to do with some deep European superiority. 
that what I call the great enrichment, which is truly great, it's amazing, happened in northwestern, began to happen in northwestern Europe, first in Holland, then in England, then in Scotland, and then in, in the mainland colonies of North, English colonies of North America, was um, uh, uh, was uh, let's see how did I start that sentence? <laughs> I'm getting lost. The, uh, the 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 oh yeah, that it happened in northwestern Europe instead of in China is an accident of the conservatism of the Qing dynasty more than of any deep European specialness. There were a series of successful challenges to hierarchy. Protestant Reformation in Northern Europe, the, um, the, the Dutch revolt against Spain, eight, the Eighty Years' War <laughs> against Spain, the English Revolution, as I've mentioned, capped off in the end of the 18th century by the American Revolution, much more radical than it's usually portrayed, and the French Revolution. And all of them could have gone the other way. If Charles had been not so stupid and, and devious and such a dishonest man by bourgeois standards, he might have compromised gotten away with not having a re revolution. If the Spaniards had been tolerant, I know it's hard to imagine, but if they had been tolerant of Protestants, they could have kept their Dutch territories. If the Spanish Armada in 1688 had successfully landed the best army in Europe led by the best generals in Europe, <laughs> the absurdity of Queen Elizabeth in full army armor at Tilbury Field in front of her ridiculous English army saying, I expect a great victory over our enemies. I know I am but a feeble woman, but I have the heart of a king and a king of England too. And ah, the men, yes, 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 yes. That was not going to happen. Had the Spanish Armada landed, England would have become Catholic again. Holland would have become Catholic because that was the main purpose of the Armada. And things would have been very different. So it, it, if, if the French had not supported the Americans in the, French Revol in the uh, American Revolution, the Americans would have been crushed by the, by, by the English, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all accidental. And that's what made the modern world. Because it advanced this idea, which you can embody in a word, liberalism. Liberalism. Not the phony liberalism that you hear about in Brazil and, and, and the kind of left-wing liberalism you hear about in the United States. Not, not conservatives kind of in liberal drag or, or socialists in liberal drag, but l l liberalism. The idea that, that the government, though worth having, should be watched very, very carefully and should be small and a light hand. As, as Adam Smith put it, we need, he said, a liberal plan of social equality, he was an egalitarian, of economic liberty. You can start a hair salon anytime you want, invent electric lights, do what you want, and um, equal, equal justice under law, as it says on the American Supreme Court. The, m the m middle volume, and here I'll end, it goes through all the various explanations, alternative explanations to this ideological one that I put forward. 
And you know, by the way, this ideological one that I put forward is very old fashioned. It's what the liberals of the 18th century said. Now, they didn't expect it to result in what I call the great enrichment. And I, I, should, make, I should tell you how big the great enrichment is. It was 3,000%, a factor of 30 of income per head. This is not about inflation or money or anything. It's real income. And 3,000% dwarfs any of the changes. The, the Song Dynasty in China was a period of great prosperity in China in this time of, in, the, in, the, in the 11th and 12th centuries. And um, um, of the Common Era. And it maybe doubled income per head in China. 100%. We're talking about 3,000%. And I think if you'll study these books every night for the next two years, you'll come to agree with me that it's that order of magnitude. And this is not my finding. This is my fellow economic historians who have established this over the last 30 or 40 years. So it's a gigantic increase. And, to, and then we have to ask what caused it. And I say ideology. My friends, most of my friends in economic history say, no, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong. They say there, there are three leading explanations, three categories of explanation. One is, you could call it the conservative explanation, which is that these wonderful capitalists started saving a lot and invested in cotton mills, and that made us rich. So it was the sort of Weberian virtue of these, of these rich people that made us all rich. And that's wrong. It's wrong for lots of reasons. One historical reason is that there have been rich people since the beginning of agriculture. There, what are you talking about? There have been big investment projects, state and private, f forever. Y humans uh, in archae archaeologically invested for one and a third million years in Aushulian hand axes. You've seen photographs of them. So investment and accumulation and saving is very old. That's the historical problem. The economic problem is that there are sharply diminishing returns to investment if there aren't new ideas. Electric lights, dropped ceilings, which you have here. This is a great easy invention. Notice that all it is is a strip of steel, and, and you have these panels, and you can easily get to the electricity or the plumbing or whatever is up there. Um, so that's the conservative explanation. The explanation on the left is exploitation. And that's equally implausible, actually for the same reason. The historical problem is that there's always been exploitation of, uh, uh, of women especially, but of slaves. Slave societies are very common. Of uh, poor people, come on. What, what, what else is agricultural hierarchy but a man on a horse with a sword who says, okay, You've got to pay me rent, as uh, Rousseau said. And the specific arguments that you hear a lot in history departments these days, that exploitation, this argument from the left, explains why we got rich, are things like imperialism. Now, as much as imperialism hurt, say, India or Angola or something like that, um, it didn't help the metropolis. It helped some people in the metropolis, that's to be admitted. But the most spectacular case is the Belgian Congo in the late 19th century, which was owned by Leopold, the, the King Leopold II. 
And his imperialism was of a particularly brutal form. He was extracting rubber from wild trees in the forest. And he forced the Congolese to go out and collect the rubber. And if they didn't collect it, he chopped off their hand. And he had a pile of hands to keep the accounting straight. So that was horrible. Did it benefit the average Belgian? Not a centime. The Congo was owned by the king. <laughs> he used the profits from it, the considerable profits, to build castles in the south of France. Not in foggy, rainy Belgium, but in Provence. <laughs> It's, it's completely absurd to think that the British Empire was profitable to ordinary British people. However insulting it was to the Indians, and I understand the insult, it wasn't profitable to Britain at any time. So exploitation doesn't work. Slavery is not a good explanation. I said slavery is... You know, Sub-Saharan Africa, well, for that matter, the whole of Africa, was a slave society for, th well, thousands of years, yet didn't have a great enrichment, didn't have a factor of 30 increase. And then finally, there's D Douglas North, my friend, old friend who died a few years ago. Institutions, legal institutions, say. Well, the trouble with that is that legal institutions, that is, rules of property and contract and so on, are what we mean by an organized society. And indeed, you don't have to have a king to have them. Iceland, in the age of the sagas, didn't have a king, but it had laws, all right. And it had laws of property and exchange. English law was more or less thoroughly completed by the time of Edward I in the 13th century. So that doesn't work. And the law doesn't change in a way that would, would fit the timing of the great enrichment. So in short, dears, I claim to have explained why we're rich. And if you want to talk about public policy, why Brazil is not as rich as it could be. Um, I, I claim to have answered Adam Smith's great question, the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And I claim throughout that this enrichment has not been corrupting. It can be if all you do is watch reality TV. A splendid example of the corruption that can happen is Donald Trump kind of a, if you had an encyclopedia article about the corruptions of the modern world, you'd have to have a photograph of Donald Trump. Also the same, another article elsewhere in the encyclopedia about narcissism, and you have a photograph of Donald Trump. But that's not necessary. A commercial society can also pr produce a dignified and intelligent President of the United States. I didn't vote for him, but I think he's dignified and intelligent um, Obama. So that's my tale. It's a liberal tale. It says that the state didn't enrich us. The state, on the whole, put hooks and chairs in our way and made bad investments like Brasilia, to name one. Uh, and that it was mainly this democratization of opportunity. As the English say, a mass of people suddenly inspirited, inspired to have a go. That's not American English, it's English English. Allowed to have a go. And boy, did they have a go. Thank you. I urge you to urge you to read my books especially to buy them
<laughs> and they're available on Amazon, now all in paper. I'm hoping that the University of Chicago Press will issue a boxed set like Harry Potter. If I earn one hundredth of what she does did, I'll die rich as well as happy. And interestingly, all three books are on, in audiobooks. So if you have a long commute, you, you can listen to them. The, the company that bought the rights from the press said, oh, we have this great man who can do it for you. He can read the books. I said, no, you aren't. You're not going to use a man to read my books. And so they got a very good actress, and she did an excellent job. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I have a, a question. Good. Let's hear and it. And then I'll open uh, to the floor. I, I think there is less debate about uh, the facts that you present, although there is some. But the, uh, I think that the point is really about causation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if I got your argument right, you say that there is variation and then selection. Yes. It's a, a kind of As uh, in evolution. evolution. Yeah. And then the question is how, why, and when do they happen? What brought about the bourgeoisie rhetorics and ethics and so forth and yeah. ideas? Actually, you chose a term, bourgeoisie, that is very much imbued with, uh, with different references. Yeah, very but much so. mostly people, I think, here would uh, refer it to class and to Marxism. Sure. I was a Marxist once, so I understand all this. I, I know. I'm just belling it out. Well, uh, maybe they don't. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so it, it brings about if it's about how, why, and do they happen, and you chose that title, uh, it immediately brings to the audience that idea that what brought at least variation about was class. But that's not what you're arguing. Actually, no. you're arguing something that for historians is very uh, puzzling uh, and problematic. Uh, and I quote an article you, you wrote uh, in response to the critiques you received from the new institutionalists. Yeah. And you say, briefly put, the liberal idea arose from from the accident in Northwestern Europe, mm -hmm. from Amsterdam to New Amsterdam, of the capacity to read the Reformation, the Dutch Revolt, the English American, the French Revolutions, the Four R's, and, and so on. Yes. Well, here in the history departments, we uh, are not much fond of, uh, of chance, hazard, and uh, how to say that? Well, I forgot a word. Counter. Uh, yeah, I understand. Counterfactuals. Counterfactuals, exactly. Yeah. And uh, also, you know, this those changes maybe they started earlier on, back to the late Middle Ages in Italy, and 16th century in the Iberian Peninsula, and elsewhere in Europe. It was more restricted those ideas to merchants, yeah. or to those who called bourgeois. That's right. And the question is, so maybe it did not happen by accident, and maybe not in North Western Europe, maybe it started earlier on and elsewhere. But why did they move elsewhere, and why did they bloom elsewhere, and yeah. how? Yeah. And then about selection. You say in your book that uh, government can block entrepreneurship in an argument that very much follows that of Schumpeter yes. and Mokil. Yes, Mokil. Uh, and I also say that the bourgeois talk was relevant only for the first industrial revolution, yeah. and it did not have to follow for the following ones. And in fact, uh, if you see the dramatic growth that also happened in Prussia, especially Prussia, 
that today is the European's largest economy. Yeah. Uh, Denmark, Russia, and later on in Japan and Korea, they were highly protected in, if you want to use the term, mercantilist yeah. economies. Yeah. Even the English during the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century, they were also had uh, mercantilist policies at least in, in foreign trade. Yes, Here, when, when the Portuguese crown just moved to Brazil, one of the things that the English made sure that yeah. they had tax advantages. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, what prevented da Vinci from becoming Thomas Edison? Well, that's right. And that, that's, that's an important uh, 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 question, and I, and I give some answers to it in the books. I mean, it is, it is a puzzle why Northern Italy or Barcelona or other parts of Iberia, Lisbon, for example, didn't have the kind of um, economic growth that Northwestern Europe had. And, or indeed, as I said, you can go further afield. You can ask why the Ottoman Empire, which was highly successful, and, and and innovated very quickly in uh, in gunpowder, but not in machinery. Why why did and so you know I I I, I can only say that, um, that well I, I I'm not going to concede everything you say, and and I don't think your argument your your uh, your question or your argument is particularly hostile to my view of what happened or why it happened. I, I think actually in the history department we had better acknowledge accident a lot more. It was a very fortunate accident that the United States got Franklin Delano Roosevelt at its, as its president at the time it did. Because it was perfectly capable, of, as so many countries did, such as Brazil, to slip into to fascism in the 1930s, and now it's trying again. Um, so, so it, 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 you know, I, the, there were accidents that, I, 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 and I, I don't think it dates to the late Middle Ages or um, precisely because the places that were economically vital in the late Middle Ages, Augsburg and uh, in parts of Germany, or for that matter, more interestingly, the Hansa, the Hanseatic League, and Northern Italy, Barcelona, and so forth, that they didn't develop suggests there's something peculiar about Holland, England, Scotland, and British North America. And what's peculiar about them? By their own declaration, now that we don't have to take that at face value, but by their own declaration, it's liberty. George II, of all people, declared that what's unusual about England, and at the time probably called Britain, is Englishmen's liberties. Now, this was the king of England. This was not something that the, that Frederick the Great or the king of France would say at the time. And in fact, you speak of, of, uh, of, of Prussia. Yes, both Prussia and the United States in the 19th century were protectionist. But on the other hand, both were very large, particularly in the, at the formation of the German Empire in 1871. So they had, and they had internal markets that were free. There weren't tariffs between German states or American states, as, by the way, there are now still among Indian states, which is quite bizarre. So they had this large free markets. You could pretty much start a business anywhere you wanted. So liberalism was the kind of soil, as it were, that made possible the great growth of Germany or the United States or Britain or, for that matter, France, even though to, to take France with its long mercantilist traditions, which go on to the modern time, Henry, Henry Kissinger, though a, 
though a war criminal, is very funny. And he said once, France is the only successful communist country. <laughs> By which he meant that back to the 16th century, it was highly centralized. Yet even in France, even in guild-clotted France, actually the, the guilds were finished off by Napoleon, but even in over-regulated France, mainly it's liberal. Brazil is a liberal country, mostly. You've made terrible mistakes in your illiberal parts, but still, it's liberal. Sweden, which is held up as an example of socialism, is not a socialist country, it's a capitalist country. So you and I would have to have a much longer discussion, it's long enough as it is, to sort out where we agree and where we disagree. Yeah, uh, I just w wanted to finish. Uh, uh, the neo-institutionalists, uh, they claim they can provide a theory for selection, maybe not for variation. Yeah. And they may say that these are maybe focal points of different equilibria, or that it yeah. was institutions that eventually selected what was feasible and what could not be chosen. On the other hand, uh, the ideas and the variations, they, many social scientists and also scientists in humanities or thinkers in humanities would claim that they're embedded socially. And that would go from Marx to Weber, uh, Bourdieu, and Granovetter. Yeah. So back to the society, uh, what is the link between ideas and behavior? Well, I, I think ideas are what run our lives. Um, we're humans, we're not dogs. Although I, I've always, I have dogs and I, lo I love dogs and they seem to have ideas too. Ah, she's gonna go out. Um, but they're not as complicated as our ideas. And I think it's just a materialist prejudice to claim that the ideas must always be superstructural on the relations of production. I mean, from kind of 18, uh, 90 to 1960, we were all Marxists of one kind or another. Even conservatives were, even conservative historians were. And we kept saying, oh, well, as we, as people used to say in the Communist Party, it's no accident that you have that idea because after all, you're objectively bourgeois, blah, 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 blah. And I, I, I just don't think it's true. I think people have ideas for all kinds of reasons. And, and it's, I, that doesn't deny that there are some um, positional uh, um, aspects of the causes of ideas. But that, say, Shakespeare, who was objectively bourgeois, was a successful entrepreneur in, in stage productions, his father was a Glover, kind of lower middle class, was hostile to the bourgeoisie, suggests that there's no, you know, there's no correspondence here. I'm not saying that we should give up the material or the institutional, but I don't think institutional, um, well, as we were saying in the cab, I think the problem with neo-institutionalism as a movement is that it doesn't get deep enough. It doesn't get into ideas. It's too much concerned with uh, uh, incentives at the level of institutions. So, so in a way, I mean, Doug North was endlessly saying that he had gotten beyond neoclassical economics and this was a whole new way of looking at the world. And then I would say to him all the time, Doug, you haven't gotten beyond neoclassical economics at all. You're still talking about incentives. Okay. So, speak up. Speak, memory. King. 
Yeah, it'd be kind of nice if you came to the microphone or or or, or stood up and spoke to them, not to me. Why don't you stand up? Because they, they can't hear you otherwise. Thank you. Don't tell me what it's about. Ask it. Yes. Well, you're. Yeah. Well, I, I, you, you don't have to call it personalistic, but you're asking the same question as my esteemed colleague here asked, in a sense. What's the relationship between ideas and matter? Um, a very interesting example of your question is, his, is Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy. In the long appendix to War and Peace, he, he's scornful of the idea that ideas have influence. And he's, he, he's an eloquent and intelligent man. And if you want to think some more about it, read that long appendix, methodological appendix, to his novel, which, by the way, is the greatest novel ever written. It's astounding. Uh, I think ideas have much more autonomy than we were accustomed to think in the age of the hermeneutics, the hermeneutics of suspicion, the age of materialism, the age of historical materialism, the age in which we all thought, even if we hadn't ever been Marxists, that ideas must be just kind of the result of your social position. There's a great book 1915, I think it is, The Economic Origins of the American Constitution, of the, uh, the U.S. Constitution. And it's an entirely Marxoid interpretation of the discussions in the Constitutional Convention in 18, starting in, a, in, in, in 1787. Um, as I say, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give essentially the same answer. Sometimes position, interest, incentives matter. Sometimes they don't. It's not correct to argue that because someone is, well, paid for by the state, as the professors here are, they must all be corrupted by that pay. Nor is it reasonable to think, because I've been, 10 years ago I was here um, at, under the auspices of the Vargas Foundation, that I am a Vargas person. It, it just doesn't make sense. It's not, it, it's not empirically true. So, I don't know. I, I, look, there's a fashion in economics for neuroeconomics. So we plant electrodes, and we watch your brain lighting up when you see ice cream. And you think, boy, that's really deep. That's, that's real understanding of the mind. No, it's not. We as historians have a mind registering, measuring, watching technique. It's called reading the sources, <laughs> where people write down stuff, and we interpret it. And that's much deeper and more accurate and more to the point than that there's a center. I call, it, I call these people, they call their science the new phrenology. Bumps for love, and bumps for this and that in the skull. And it, it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't get, get very far. But what does get far is what we do as historians. Mind, well, I could quote some poetry to that effect, but it's English poetry, I won't.
Levanta e fala usa o microfone. You're close. Why don't you come to the microphone? That'll make your voice big. Eu queria pedir para quem mais quiser fazer perguntas já ir ficando to, aqui yeah, perto para a gente agilizar. Go ahead, press the button, did you? Okay. Yeah, you did it. Is it working? I think it's it's working now. I don't speak very loud, so I think it's better. That's so. good. Uh, so I'm an economist. Yes. Congratulations. But, yeah. <laughs> But I'm, a, I'm an economist turning into a historian. Good. Person. Good, you're like yeah. me. Yes. Yeah, so. I, be I believe your, uh, I, I've read your work, and I, I think I'm convinced by your arguments. This is uh, a man of taste. <laughs> <laughs> Not only the books, but mostly your argument about humanomics and how to do economics good and against you. materialism. Good, good. But you know, it, it is not easy to, to par part ways with old ideologies. So it really is. Yes. So sometimes I, I keep thinking about so I'll I'll continue in this in this topic of the relationship between ideas and, and matter. No? Yeah. So so as I said, I'm mostly convinced but by your argument, but I sometimes think about if there are not there aren't any I don't know precon material material preconditions so oh, yeah. those ideas could emerge. I think so. I don't are. know, for example, uh, land ownership. Maybe in a society where yeah. few people uh, control land, it, it's hard to come with an idea of all men are born equal or something like this. Or, or other, other I think you're right. And, and, and I think that that's a very important point. That, for example, suppose you're, you're <laughs> You're a peasant like the ancestors of all of us, including me, and you're just terribly poor. And as a woman, you work all day cooking and, and uh, tending the garden and the cow and washing the clothes. And as a man, you're out in the field uh, plowing and scaring the crows away and so forth. You don't have time to think about your social position. So enrichment had consequences. One consequence was socialism. It's very interesting <laughs> that socialism develops when people start getting wealthier. I don't mean very wealthy, but a little bit wealthier. It's only in the really the middle of the 19th century that the idea of socialism starts to take over the imagination of the West. And j just to give one example of the point you're making, if you grow up on a farm, if you're a child and you grow up on a farm or in a small business where you know the, your apartment is above the shop and you help your mother and father run the shop, you sweep the floor and they attend to the customers, then you're going to understand bourgeois economics very easily. Whereas if you grow up like me, the child of an academic, a professor, who doesn't, doesn't know where meat comes from, so to speak, doesn't have any contact with the material, uh, how the economy works in any serious way, Then you're, then you're a natural socialist because people come from families. And families are socialist enterprises, especially bourgeois families are, reasonably well-to-do families. Money appears <laughs> from the office. It descends like rain. And mother is the central planner. And to each according to her need, from each according to his ability. So it's very natural for bourgeois children to become socialists. And this is true of every generation. The Bernie Sanders voters, the, uh, the uh, Jeremy Corbyn voters. Bernie and, and Jeremy and I are about the same age. And in 1961, we all had the same opinion. We were all socialists. And then I grew out of it. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. And it's, it's an important point that I ought to take, I don't know. I, any, 
way one ought to be alert to the material influences on ideas, but one also ought to be alert to the ide ide ideational influences on the economy. Okay, come on, why don't you come up to the mic? Come on down. Eu queria pedir para as pessoas já virem quem quer fazer pergunta. You talked about the importance of accidents in historical explanation. Yeah. yeah. And this uh, reminded me of an article you wrote in the early 90s about chaos history. Yeah, that's right. Chaos theory in history. I know. Well, from in the last few years, uh, a lot has been written on, on, on complexity theory and social yeah. sciences. Has your assessment on the limits of historical explanation changed ever since? Well, you know, I, the, the, the article he's re referring to was in History and Theory, a kind of a methodological journal in history. And I got all tangled up in, 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 in chaos theory and, and nonlinear dynamics. And I realized that so much of our life is accidental. Who we marry, who we divorce, <laughs> well, that's kind of generated, I must say, by who we marry. <laughs> um, what we study, even what our politics is, can be influenced by very tiny events. And that's kind of a worry for historians. I mean, we're historians here, most of us. And we'd like it not to be so that the personal character of Lenin determined the outcome of the 1917 revolutions. But I think it's pretty clear it did. So that's kind of the conclusion I came to in that article, that in order to do history that depends on big stuff, right? Bourgeois revaluations, the invention of agriculture, things like that. You, you've got to acknowledge that some of it is accidental. Some of it's accidental. The character of Augustus, uh, Octavius was his name, the first Roman emperor, you know, had a heck of a lot to do with the course of Roman history in the next four centuries. We're, we're, we Americans are extreme, uh, people of the United States are very fortunate that George Washington was our first president. Another country I, I know and love, I've taught there, South Africa, is blessed that Nelson Mandela was its first president. And those are accidents. So I, I can't give you any general advice except to watch out for the accidents and watch out for the, <laughs> for the big waves. And don't be dogmatic about either. Mais perguntas. A ideia foi justamente ter uma apresentação menor para a gente poder ter debate. Então, por favor, não fiquem tímidos. Pergunta outra vez. Sure, ask in Portuguese, he can translate. You know, I, I'm, to put it mildly, not an expert on Latin America. I just learned the other day that you have to say, I have to say, obrigada. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that. I, I, and I don't speak even Spanish. But Angerman and, Angerman and uh, Sokolov, I imagine, got it right. Because I, I, I knew both of them quite well. And, uh, and I'm so sorry that that the Sokolov died so young. And they're, they were, they're excellent scholars. So if, if they say that <laughs> there's this heritage of that older c colonial hierarchy, I, I'm, I'm inclined to believe it must be there. Um, I, 
Look, I, th I think cultures can change, sometimes remarkably quickly, but sometimes they don't change and persist remarkably long. So it's a mixed bag. I mean, um, liberalism came to Europe in historical terms rather suddenly. And there was no inevitability about it, I suppose, although so many people had liberal ideas in the 18th century. And they, they, they were, of course, infecting each other to some degree, but still, uh, the, there, there is something going on there more, more, more deeply, and I explore some of it in the third volume. But uh, on, the, on the other hand, some features of Europe stay the same. We Europeans, and I, most of us are Europeans or Africans um, by blood, are Christian in a deep sense, even if we're not Christian, even if we're not practicing Christians, or at least Abrahamic. And we have deep ideas about individuality that are not so popular in other cultures, certainly not in Hinduism, for example. So uh, you're asking a very big uh, um, question. I can only give a kind of pumpkin answer, a big answer. I want to hear a female voice. Oh, good. Go for it, girl. Come on. It's always the guys who speak first, and I wish it wasn't true. Sure. I would ask to, I wanted to ask you for talk a little bit more about the idea of a mainly protestant society, how this cannot be a part of the explanation about the modern world. Well, I, I mean, the ethics of a religion are an idea too, or no, I, I don't think I, I get this. I, I do, you know, again, we're, we're, we're back to Max Weber. And it's a very attractive book because it uses a ideological spark Calvinism to start a fire <laughs> in material kindling the economy. And people like that kind of argument, and that's actually the characteristic of my books too, because it's ideological sparks or kindling, the, or I don't know, change the metaphor a bit that, that starts this thing burning. <sighs> but I don't think Weber was correct. It's not true that Protestants make the best entrepreneurs. And it, it wasn't true in the 16th century. One third of the entrepreneurs in Amsterdam were Catholics. One third. They had fled from the Spanish um, in, in the south of the Low Countries, many of them, or had always been Catholics in Amsterdam and the businesses and shipping companies and so on, one third were owned by Catholics. There's nothing about Catholicism that disables one from being a business person or an entrepreneur. In fact, one of the interesting developments in the Middle Ages is the um, urban monks, St. Saint, Saint Francis, San Francesco, and, um, and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, try to adjust to the urban world that they faced. Instead of scorning the urban world, as monks, monasteries had done earlier, they tried to, they tried to theologically justify the creativity of the business person as being analysis, analogous to God's creativity in making the universe. So I, I, it, everyone believes, certainly Max Weber believed, it's very important to realize, that Ma Max Weber was a, a Prussian, came from North Germany. And Northern Germans who were Protestants, sometimes Calvinists, were contemptuous of Southern Germans and Austrians, 
uh, Bavarians and Austrians who were Catholic. And they had all kinds of north-south sneering in them. You know, all those lazy people down south, they, they do carnival all the time and they, they, they do too much samba and so forth. And that's the, one of the last time I was in, uh, in this town, I, I, I went to a samba school. And, and okay, and, and, but I think there's a deep North German prejudice against Catholicism that's coming out in Max Weber. And then people take it up. They hear about it and think, oh yeah, oh yeah, it must be Protestants. It's the, it's the damn Pope who stopped economic growth. And as you pointed out, Northern Italy, Barcelona, Lisboa, they're all Catholic and they're all very successful economically. Come on. And uh, ideologies from the scholastics. What? And ideology from medieval scholasticism. Well, that's true. That's exactly true. I mean, t take the school of, uh, of Salamanca, yeah. which is my favorite group of monks there. And they, I had the honor to speak at a conference a few years ago at the very lecture hall that the great Dominican monks of Salamanca in the 16th century, where they articulated a market vision for Europe. Yes, dear, stand up or come to the mic or shout or something. It's good, but speak mainly to them because Yeah. yeah. Well, I, again, you're rearticulating the the materialist hypothesis, and I and I worry about it. I just think it's it's a it's a bit of a dogma that people's social position determines their possibilities. Now, you know, if you're a poor black Brazilian from the Northeast and you didn't graduate high school, your material conditions will have a lot to do with what you think and what you're able to do in life. I, I admit that. Um, although, you know, you can, you can, if you're Thomas Edison or something, you can exceed expectations. But I, and, 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 and again, it comes back to this issue of what kind of minimal material conditions are necessary to allow people to have the liberty to exercise their, their ideas in a freer way. Think of modern music modern cuisine, modern painting, modern dance, modern poetry, modern intellectual life generally, modern scholarship, modern science. It's liberty to go where we want to, to try out a Marxist approach to, I don't know, um, slave plantations in Brazil uh, or a, uh, a liberal approach to economic growth and its failures, Brazil in the last quarter century. Those, are, those require a certain minimum, I don't know, prosperity or they can't happen. So to, to that extent, I agree, but, but, but <laughs> I think it's true, and I think you'll agree with me, that as we get richer, materially richer, I mean, look around you. This is amazing. We're, we're as I said, we're all descended from peasants. I look around. I don't see any uh, Habsburg chins. I, I take it there are very few descendants of the crowned heads of, of uh, Europe here. Um, here we are, a bunch of peasants, 
descendants of peasants discussing the philosophy of history. And that, that's where, so, the, the, I, so I suppose what I'm saying, and I haven't really thought of this before, liberty is a cause, that's my claim here, but it's also a result of economic growth to some degree. And the richer you get, the freer you are to have crazy ideas or crazy music or crazy cuisine, right? To try out stuff, to have a go. Mike. Yes, please, stand up. Thank you. Uh, Don't tell me what it's about. Ask it. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of it. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I'm very tolerant of inequality if the inequality is caused by clever people thinking up new ideas and earning profits from that which eventually get 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 dissipated as we say in economics, get dissolved by entry, free entry and competition. I'm not sympathetic with inequalities if caused by clever people inventing stuff and then they erect barriers with the help of the government against competition. And I'm not sympathetic with people who are rich because they've stolen it. And I'm not sympathetic with inequality caused by, again, government influence. But I am, I don't worry too much about inequality if it's this, this first kind I mentioned, that it's the churning of a creative society, people are going up and down and, and there. In the meantime, we're all getting much better off. Phony liberalism on the right would be people who call themselves liberal who are actually conservative. Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist, had a nice essay at the end of uh, kind of an appendix to his book called The Constitution of, of Liberty, which says, which entitled, Why I Am Not a Conservative. Hayek was a liberal. He said, look, here's the big, the big difference. Conservatives are very pleased with all evolutions up to the present. <laughs> and then they want to stop. If there's evolved a hierarchy of men over women. Stop. No equal rights amendment. If there's evolved, a, you know, yeah, conservative. Whereas a liberal like me um, is wants evolution to go on. Feels and is is kind of insanely optimistic about the about about evolution about the future about the variation and selection and the other term, namely the, the, the fixing, the, the uh, uh, we forget what the biologists call it, but anyway. Um, so I, I uh, the, you know, my, my friends on the left of the United States often call themselves liberals, although they're start, you know, the, the conservatives in the United States have made the word dirty in the minds of a lot of simple-minded people. And so now my friends call themselves progressives. And I'm willing to, to give them that term as long as I can take back the L word. Uh, for people who want a everyone to be free, that's what liberalism is. You could say there are two things. They want everyone to be free and they want no one to, it's kind of a part of the first, they want no one to have power, violent power, over other people. They don't want the government or anyone else to push people around. They want 
a society in which violence is minimized, now you've got to have some violence, I admit it, but where it's, it's kept to, is lo, uh, to really low amounts, and where mainly it's about persuasion, sweet talk, exchange. I agree to buy your hairdressing services, and you agree to buy my educational services, and we all kind of get along with each other. That's the liberal vision. It's very egalitarian, because it doesn't set bureaucrats above people, this man who just won the Nobel Prize in economics, Thaler, is in favor of nudging because he thinks that all of you are stupid, you, you and me, that we don't know what's good for us and uh, we should let him tell us what's good for him. And I just think that's very illiberal. I call it the applied theory of fascism. Um, you know the three most unbelievable sentences? Number one, the check is in the mail. I'll pay manana, pasado manana. Of course I'll respect you in the morning. Of course I'll respect you in the morning. And I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Sorry, it's kind of shocking. <laughs> I'm sure you're, you're able to handle it. <laughs> More questions? Well, why don't you come up to the mic? That, that'd be better. That'd be good. Karl Popper estava preocupado com os regimes totalitários e a relação deles com o que ele chamava de doutrina historicista. É, doutrinas historicistas, historicismo. Yeah. É, ele, é, ele acreditou que pôde refutar isso dizendo que o, o, que o conhecimento da nossa sociedade, que tinha um alto desempate, é, eram imprevisíveis. Eu gostaria de saber se, se, a import, yeah. se a importância que você atribui às ideias podem ser reduzidas a certas leis históricas. É, podem ser reduzidas a certas leis históricas ou se elas são imprevisíveis. Well, I think they're fundamentally unpredictable. Karl Popper speaks of three worlds. There's a material world, there's the social world, and there's the intellectual world. Ideas about society are the physical world, so it's a world above the three. And this third world is deeply unpredictable. Um, and I'm, I admire Popper, although I don't think he was radical enough. But um, I, I, I don't think that well, you know, some things in the social wor world are predictable, but <laughs> I wrote a book in 1990 called If You're So Smart, The Rhetoric of Economic Expertise. And the theme of that book was, I, I called it the American question. And the joke is, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? If you, if, if you can predict the future of society in any substantial way, you can make investments that'll make you rich. If you knew the future of housing prices in Sao Paulo, if you thought they were gonna go down, you could short, short them. If you thought they were gonna go up, you could buy and speculate on them. You could get a second, third mortgage on your own property and, you know, you could, if, if you really knew what was going to happen in painting or mathematics, you could become famous by, by predicting it. So, now, now look, the sun is going to come up, as we say metaphorically, tomorrow. And so we can't make any, any money out of that. Uh, if it's going to rain tomorrow, Everyone knows that, and you, you can't make any money. 
but anything you can make money or fame out of anything else you consider desirable has to be unpredictable in human society. See what I mean? There's a fundamental paradox there. The, the economists called the Rational Expectations School make a lot of this. I don't entirely agree with them, but uh, it, and, and it's actually, it's a problem in the history of European socialism because the claim of historical materialism is that we know what's going to happen in history and it's going to happen. In which case, what is the point of social democratic or re revolutionary socialist parties? <laughs> what's their role? What's the role of the party if it's already going to come about? If it's going to rain, the meteorologists don't cause it. And, and, and you can't say, oh well, you know, it was the rainmaker who made it rain. So there's a deep contra contradiction in, in uh, European socialism of the last 150 years. And it's similar to the problem of predicting the future in the economy or the intellectual world or the society in a way that would be advantageous. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Of course, there's the opposite joke, which is if you're, if you're rich, why are you so stupid? <laughs> which, again, would apply to Donald Trump. Interestingly, a chance is the scholastic legitimation for profit. It, what, uh, chance. Chance. Because it's not, it's not foreseeable. So if you ca cannot know that you're going to have, if you know that you're going to have profit, then it's usury. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. That's right. That's right. That, that's, that, that's, yeah, you're, you're exactly correct theologically. That is, they, they said if you work for your profits, and there's labor involved, that's okay. They had uh, Aquinas, in that sense, had kind of a labor theory about also it. Also, if you take chances. But that's right. If you take a chance, the, the, the first scene of The Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare is a wonderful example of what you're saying. Because Antonio, who loves Bassanio, his friend, he's, he's in love with him. He was gay. Um, he, he's sad. And his friend said, Antonio, are you sad because of the chance you're taking in your merchant activities? He says, no, 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 no. My, my, I, I forget the exact phrase, but my, my ships are all diverse. I've got a diverse portfolio. So uh, I'm not sad. And then his friend says, oh, you must be sad for love. <laughs> It's a wonderful passage. More questions? Come on, for the honor of the team. Coraggio. Yes, dear. Well, my, it's much better than my Portuguese. Well, why don't you go here? It's even better, because then it makes your voice big. She's a colleague from the Department of Economics. Nice to meet you, dear. I'm, I'm you also an uh, uh, economic history teacher. I love it so that there are so many economic <laughs> historians at this university. Well, and uh, I was thinking, uh, I haven't read your book. Oh. I just bought it yesterday. Well, you bought I read it. The, the chapter titles. I like the, the, the kind of history they, they, yeah. they tell. But I was thinking about the women's part in all of the the ideas yeah and and all your your point in this in our conversation here yeah is that uh thoughts change the world yeah. so uh, my question it's about is what's the women's part in all of it because women and almost uh, any society are the the center of the reproduction Yes, that's for and sure. And the education 
of children. The children, both uh, boys and girls. So. Yeah, that's right. If you have a mother who can read, your probability of learning to read is quite high. If only their father knows to read, your probability of learning to read is quite low. And this is universal. This is true in all societies. Well, I, I have to confess, and I'm kind of ashamed of this. Although I'm a feminist, and I'm a stout supporter of uh, IAFI, and I've gone to some of their conferences, and I've written some on, 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 uh, on feminism, and even female English female um, labor force participation in the 20th century. I have an article on that. These books don't have enough about, the, about women. And not just because, oh, we got a balance set that's 50% over 50% of humankind. That's not the point. It may be causative. It may be causal. Because it is true that Holland, where it all started, because oddly, Southern Europe didn't have it. But the big bourgeois society of the Low Countries, especially the Northern Low Countries, free of Spanish um, governance, had shockingly free women. Um, and this didn't please anyone. The Spaniards were simply appalled. But even the English who came across and saw these women wandering around without any chaperones, middle-class women, and uh, market women dealing, and women owning enterprises and so on, which was against English common law, if you were married at least. Um, there's something going on there that I need to face. And it's frequently the, they're, they're, they're on the other side, I'm always trying to compare it with China or South Asia, Japan, Ottoman Empire, because those are the lively possibilities for a counterfactual history, for an alternative history. They could have been the places where this happened, but they didn't. So what's the difference? What's the crucial difference? And one of the differences is that in China, women, like they are in current day, um, some authoritarian Islamic societies are confined to the household in a way that they weren't even in England. So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm very uneasy about this question and I hope when you read these, you'll, you'll write to me and say, now wait a second, shouldn't, shouldn't there be a... St now, what is quite distressing in my view is that misogynistic rhetoric didn't break through as a liberal value, as you know, until well into the 19th century. I mean, um, Abigail Adams, John Adams' wife, has a famous letter that she sends to her husband as away in Washington or somewhere. She's back on the farm in Massachusetts. And, and, oh, I think it was in the Constitutional Convention uh, late in the 1780s. And, and <laughs> she says... I forget the exact phrase, but I think it's don't forget the ladies, by which she meant in liberating ordinary Americans, don't forget the women. But then he proceeded, and all the conventioners, all men con proceeded, just as they didn't liberate slaves disastrously, in the Constitutional Convention, they didn't liberate women. So the English common law rules that if you married, you lost all your economic, political, legal identity and were absorbed in your husband, continued well into the 19th century. On the frontier, actually, interestingly, I'll bet you this was true in Brazil too, um, women had much more autonomy because they were much more valuable. You had to have a farm wife if you were going to have a farm on the Great Plains. I mean, it wasn't just optional. It wasn't just because you wanted to have someone around. It's because you couldn't run the farm without it. So I, I'm ashamed. No, don't be. 
I was thinking about uh, Jane Austen persuasion. So Jane Austen is, is my heroine. And, and the women ha have a great persuasion power in the for informing a whole society. Yeah, her, her theme is always ethical. Her heroines, her, the major characters, always develop, especially the young women she's talking about, always develop ethically in the course of the book. The, the minor characters are just, um, they're, they're comic characters and they stay the same through the whole book. And they're the ones who are motivated by self-interest alone. Whereas the, the, um, the, the ma I always get the names of her heroines all mixed up in my mind, but the various heroines, they develop ethically and that's kind of, that's the depth of her books. If all they were were very funny portrayals of uh, the craziness of gentry society in the marriage game, which is what the superficial plot is all about, they would not be as profound or important as they are. But she's got this ethical engine behind it, which makes for great literature. There is one, one more, and I'll and you be brief, and I'll be brief. Why don't you stand up so they can hear you? Just, just ask it. Just say what it is, dear. Ask the question. Materialism. the key point that, that in 1800 we were all very poor and yet there were some of us who were thinking I mean look in the world the average in 1800 looks something like two dollars or three dollars a day which is what Chad now earns um, it's appalling whereas Brazil now is about 33 dollars a day which is ten times more than what it was and the United States is $130 a day, four times more than Brazil. So um, I'm not saying that you can't have liberal ideas until you've reached a certain stage of enrichment because they came, well, they came from a small group of intellectuals who were reasonably well off, Jane Austen, for example, before Everyone was rich. Not everyone, but most of us. I, I, I'm, I'm not against idealism. I, I'm not a Hegelian. I'm not an idealist in that way. Uh, the only word I can think of is ideational. Because I say that ideas are important and they have an independent influence. Um, and they're not entirely endogenous. I was just conceding to my colleagues here, to you all, and my colleagues, that of course... There is some effect from material conditions and, and riches to ideas. But if it were all interest, history would be a pretty grim tale of selfish bastards screwing each other. 
Now there's a good deal of that in history, <laughs> the crimes and, of humankind. But I think there is a space for ideas, both good and bad. Some of the ideas of intellectuals are extremely bad. The idea that countries have racial histories, for example, which virtually all intellectuals in the world believed in 1910, which had its uh, worst fruits in Germany. Although actually, the countries that, well, the, the, let's not get into that, but okay. Ha, the, the idea that countries have stages of development and that the Dutch rule Indonesia because the poor Indonesians are primitive and can't take care of themselves. And after, in around 1910, the Dutch imperialists were, were justifying what they were doing by saying, well, in two or three centuries, the Indonesians will be mature enough to have their own self-government. Meanwhile, we Dutch will take care of it. And th that kind of European, sort of theorized European uh, uh, racism was an idea and had very little to do with, well, it had, had to do with imperial interests, but it, it wasn't caused by them. People developed these ideas kind of on their own and they were, s they, we, we decided after a long time that they were very stupid. So it's not that there's, I'm not making a kind of Whiggish point that we're always getting smarter and, and uh, but, but, but the liberal idea was a good one that we're all created equal is a good idea and I approve of it and so should you. And the idea that we shouldn't push people around violently is a good thing and let's implement it. Okay, so on this good tone of not imposing things by force <laughs> on other people I think we should close. I'd like to thank again uh, Professor McCloskey for Thank you all very much. It's been, it's been good fun. E para terminar, eu gostaria aqui de dizer enquanto a professora McCloskey quer vender aqui os livros dela. Eh, I'm saying that as much as one of seller books. Eu é, queria convidar a todos vocês aqui que não são do departamento e também quem é do departamento, que se engajem nas atividades do Programa de Pós-Graduação em História Econômica e nas atividades do departamento também. Todos são convidados e é muito, como vocês estão vendo, é muito produtivo uh, o diálogo interdisciplinar. Então, as pessoas da, da economia, os outros departamentos que venham para cá e vice-versa, a gente não precisa concordar, como a gente não está concordando em tudo aqui, e isso é parte do aprendizado. Tá bom? Obrigado. This guy, the, 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 this guy speaks very good English, and he also speaks Hebrew, and reads Dutch, and it just embarrasses me. Because they're the, here's the joke. Person who knows three languages is called trilingual. Person who knows two is called bilingual. Person who knows one is called an American. <laughs> <laughs>